What's up, everybody? Happy Friday, top of the afternoon to you. Special show today, very insightful show today, especially for business owners and anybody that has employees. Before I introduce my guest today, the message of the week, and this is a quote that my guest today is said is one of his favorites. It's synonymous, but uh, it really strikes at the heart of what he does, and it is there are two kinds of people in this world, those who need help and get it, and those who need help and don't. <laughs> With that, I would like to introduce my guest today, Eric Sarver. He is an employment law and business law attorney. He has his own practice here in Manhattan, New York City. Eric, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Jeremiah, thanks for having me. I'm doing pretty well. Thanks. Very awesome. nice to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Eric also will we'll make the big announcement later, but he's also uh, going to be hosting his own show here on the network, I think. So today's kind of like a test, a test ride for Eric. We're gonna we're gonna give him the wheel a little bit and let and and let him uh, take off with it. Uh, he's got plenty of experience doing uh, what uh, your other shows and and um, speeches and and forums and panels and stuff like that. But he he's he's taken the plunge into into his own show we'll talk about that a little later so eric uh you you have a practice here in manhattan correct that's right that's right you got your my idea i have a my law firm which is located in Harold square so it's over at uh, 106 west 32nd street right between um, 6th and 7th avenue and cheap, cheap neighborhood huh <laughs> you know it actually they, it is definitely affordable and uh one of the reasons i chose it was too also because it's so close to penn station and yeah. so my wife and i we live we've got a young baby and we're out here in new jersey uh for any new jersey listeners out there we, um i give a shout out to you but uh so we part of the factory was hey i can just jump on new jersey transit walk down the street get to my office get settled in see tons of people that I know, see clients, see colleagues. Um, of course, COVID-19 was not really expected in the cards when making that calculation, but uh, but yeah, yeah, I'm in New York City and it's been, it's been a good place to be. I love New York. Um, have you, have, you haven't been going into the office much lately, have you? No, I've actually been working from home uh, and then I set up a small uh, satellite office here in New Jersey. Okay. I found a very small little modest space to rent uh, and that's more for my own just uh, separation, nice little boundary between right home life and work life. Just my uh, wife's working from home. Uh, you know, I'm working from home, so we just I thought it might be good to get a little little bit of space and distance. So yeah, but no. I, I will be seeing clients, of course, uh, in consultations and having scheduled trips into the city. And you know, we'll be reassessing the the safest way to get from point A to point B. You know, my office space is pretty safe and in terms of the trains and Penn Station um, I'm gonna just see how that how that goes and just yeah. you know, take it one day at a time you know that's just it. <laughs> right. are you a are you a New York or New Jersey native are you are you did you grow up up here you know I am a New York native uh, Jeremiah I I was born in Brooklyn but nice. I'm not gonna say I was a Brooklyn kid because my parents moved with myself and my sister moved the family out to uh, Long Island uh, to Valley Stream back when, in, when I was about 10 months old. So I really spent my life growing up in Long Island and then I spent four years after that upstate, uh, not prison, college, you know, um, <laughs> where, that sounded. and but, that's uh, where he got three. skilled in law. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. That motivated me. That would be a great story for your your podcast and talk show. Oh, but uh, so I went up to, the, up to college in Binghamton, just a little brief, maybe overview of myself. And mm -hmm. then I came down here to uh, Long Island again for hospital law, moved to Astoria, Queens uh, with a good buddy of mine, and then out to the Upper East Side for a while. Uh, met my soon to be wife, then girlfriend who was in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and then we moved to New Jersey. And so, um, well, we enjoy Jersey. It's nice, you know, it's, it's a good place to be. I had trouble at first adjusting to the, the driving in Jersey, the jug handles and all the different uh, sure. things like that. But, you know, it's all been, it's been a really nice, uh, nice place, you know, so. What, uh, what part of Brooklyn did your family live in before you moved? Yeah, they were in Coney Island. They oh, were, nice. uh, or right in between Coney Island and yeah. Brighton Beach, right around that, yeah, off Seabrook Avenue. Um, and it's kind of funny story too, because one of my best friends, my friend Brian, I'll give it a shout out in case he's watching. Hi, Brian. Uh, <laughs> 
he, we grew up together in Valley Stream. He actually now lives in Brighton Beach, um, not too far from my parents that live. So yeah. that's the part of Brooklyn that I was uh, originally born and originally from. So it's one of my favorite places in Brooklyn, for sure. I, I do love Brooklyn, though. It's great. I mean, I had friends and, and colleagues and, and other things I've done in Brooklyn, out in Park Slope, Prospect Heights, um, been to Gravesend years ago. Uh, there's a lot of great places in Brooklyn, like Sheepshead Bay and you've got Manhattan Beach. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's a great place, sure. So, uh, so what, what was, what was it that uh, led you to prison to study law? <laughs> <laughs> right, that, that's we don't have to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, that's the story we're going for. And again, for the record, it was Binghamton uh, College. That, <laughs> so that uh, there's no state bar inquiry about uh, uh, non-disclosed information. No, I'm joking. But uh, what led me to study law? You know, it's, it's interesting. I've always had this. Um, well, I, I've always had this affiliation for advocacy, right? You know, for sticking mm. up for people that I thought needed help. And uh, thinking up for myself, you know, I came from a family where we were taught to, you know, assert our needs, you know, to, to speak up when something was, was not right. Um, and also, I just latched on to some interesting TV shows about law back when I was coming up, back in the 80s. And I think just liking the advocacy part was one aspect. But then as I got older and more mature, the dream of being a lawyer, which I spoke about when I was 9 or 10, and didn't really know what it meant, that, you know, got changed. And then I started to get into mm -hmm. a little bit of pre-law in college, and I just love, I love the analysis, I like the, uh, the interpretation, creativity. Um, this may be surprising to people that know me, but I like to talk, and so you get to speak and argue and debate them all, and so that was a nice little added bonus thrown in there, so. Yes, that's yeah. awesome. Um, I, a good friend of mine, a neighbor, he was one of my first guests on the show when I, when I started mm -hmm. it, uh, Sam Himmelstein, he's a tenant lawyer. He's, uh, he's a partner in a law firm in lower Manhattan. Um, and you know, he's, he's a, a bit older, but I, I got to really talk to him about his progression and coming up to the point where, you know, he, he was just working, you know, he was a lawyer in another office and he just hustled so hard. They basically had no choice but to make him a partner. Can you talk a little bit? Because not only are you a lawyer, but you're, you're a small business owner as well. So you, you represent businesses, but you also have your own. Um, what was the progression like for you to, uh, to open your own firm? Yeah, thank you for asking. That's a great question, Jeremiah. I'm happy to talk about that a little bit. So it's interesting. When I finished law school. So I came out of law school in the fall of 1998. And my my goal then was not to own my own practice. At that point, I envisioned myself working for small, maybe, maybe medium-sized firms. Uh, I wanted to be a, an employment labor lawyer from the get-go, from once I got into law school and, and just fell in love with employment law. And, and then I also did a lot of civil rights litigation and appeals. And so my original thought was I will work for a few small practices, which I did. I worked for two small firms up until 2001. And then I just got bit by that entrepreneurial bug. You know, it's interesting. It started out, uh, Jeremiah, not so much with the law practice. It started out with a different business, a company I opened called Per Diem Works. And Per Diem Works Incorporated, mm -hmm. essentially my goal there was I would handle other law firms' motions, practice, their research, their discovery, court appearances, depositions, and then I hired a team of six lawyers on a rotation to cover different things in different areas. And the thinking I had was if I can do this for a while, I can get really well established with other lawyers who don't practice employment law and labor law. And so they get to know me, they get to know the quality of my work and that I'm reliable. And then when they have an employment law referral to farm out, they don't have to look very far. So I ended up getting referrals of employment law cases. And I started out doing the plaintiff side. But the motivation, I think, was just a, um, it, it wasn't like one seminal moment. It was just kind of a gradual realization that, you know, I can do this on my own. And I'd have more creative license, more freedom in terms of the clients I would select, in terms of how I want to go about things. You know, I, I naively thought back in 2001, when I started my practice, that um, I would have uh, less or fewer people to answer to. And for <laughs> <laughs> anyone who runs a business, like I know you run a few businesses, you know that you always have people to answer to. You have clients, you have uh, judges if you're in litigation. 
you have, you know, your uh, uh, referral sources, you might want an update, you know, you've always got people to, uh, and as I got older and matured, um, you know, the thought of them answering to people, you know, it didn't really bother me as much. So I, I like to joke that I have many bosses, I got my, my oh, yeah. bosses and I got myself. Um, but yeah, that definitely, and then once I started, just that you mentioned the hustle and, you know, I loved the hustle and I still do. And I, networking and public speaking, blogging and writing, the social media marketing, a big fan of LinkedIn and Alignable and mm-hmm. Facebook and Twitter. And uh, I, I, I find that as enjoyable as practicing law. I don't know if you maybe have a similar experience when you are out there, you know, getting your face up there, getting your business out there. And I find that my clients have that too. You know, they're, a lot of my clients these days are, I'm finding, are very frustrated because they want to focus on their craft or their service or their product. And they're getting kind of bogged down with all the COVID-19 rules and regulations, which are important and necessary, I believe, in these regulations and rules. And they're also not sure how these new rules kind of intersect with or feed into and feed off of long-standing rules around disability discrimination and around avoiding disability discrimination and around right. wages and hours and overtime and what to do when you have a remote workforce. So um, so there's a lot there's a lot there to unpack. That's a little yeah. bit of my, my story. Yeah. We'll 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 crack, crack that uh, can open in the in oh. the next segment. We got a couple minutes before our our first break. Um mm-hmm. You so you've been in your you've had your own practice for almost 20 years now. Did, did mm-hmm. I hear that correctly? 2001 was when you started. That's right, April 16th. It was um, 19 years ago. Yep, yeah, wow. Uh, and and being a business owner and representing small, you know, small to, to medium sized businesses, uh, how did how does that how did that like kind of impact you and and your, your choice for the type of practice that you're doing. I mean, do you, do you have employees at your place or is it just you for the most part and you uh, contract out other things or do you actually have uh, a team? So I, I have independent contractors mm-hmm. who are very well set up and documented as such. I have two of counsel attorneys that do some work for me um, when I need to farm things out to them. They have their own practices and I have a per diem our legal does the same thing. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. I don't have employees now. I did years ago. I used to have uh, a part-time secretary and a law intern, a research assistant. Uh, I found that, especially in the administrative side of things, that with all the updates in technology around administration, calendaring and, and, and apps and such, uh, even the hour upgraded, more sophisticated, bill of hour type of program software, I really don't have that need for yeah. administrative. And I think it would take me, knowing my personality, being true to myself, it would take me longer, I think, to uh, train someone and then to double check mm-hmm. everything, make sure it's correct, you know, um, before it goes out. So a short answer, the short answer is that it's not just me, I'm not just uh, an island, but I don't have any employees of my own, um, which some of my clients have that same setup, so I talked to them about how to set that up properly and not get into trouble properly. Yeah, that's got to be a big help. Mm. It's got to be a big help. Cool. We're going to take a quick break, everybody. We'll be back in just a minute. And we're going to pick up with what's going on in terms of regulation with employees and businesses in this crazy, crazy time. So hang tight. We'll be back in just a few. You're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. Okay, everybody. Welcome back again. Top of the afternoon, Friday. You're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. Juicy, juicy conversation today with attorney Eric Sarver. He is a New York City-based attorney that specializes in employment law and business law, which is, it's got to be top of mind for business owners these days because Mm -hmm. it is a constantly changing environment. I know just from the restaurant side of things and and the, uh, forget about even the employees yet, just, you know, everybody's uh, scrambling to set up these uh these street side cafes where they're taking over parking spaces and oh, yeah. and building their enclosures and literally every week the city <laughs> announces like an adjustment and sometimes you don't you don't get a warning and they just show up you know it could be department of transportation department of buildings department of health like all they basically said be ready for anybody to come through and they may just give you a fine that might be like your 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 awareness of the situation is is a fine mm-hmm. <laughs> like oh you can't do that or it has to be this or 
they, they've got the, the the tape out and the white gloves and it's it's a kind of a hot mess and and from mm -hmm. your perspective you're seeing just like a panorama of constantly changing updating uh regulations that particularly apply to employees correct absolutely jeremiah i'm seeing a lot of that i mean everything you described in terms of just you've got the city and their ordinances around things like cafes and the parking space is a good example you've got the department of licensing and consumer affairs and you've also got the department of labor the new york state department of labor is a very powerful branch of the government and a very aggressive branch of that and so you've got your long-standing employment laws and labor and wage and hour laws that have been in effect you know, long before COVID-19 struck yeah. and long before the pandemic. But you've also got now um, <clears throat> different laws around things like sick leave, or quarantine leave. You've got uh, extra pay for quarantine employees if that does arise. We've got federal legislation, right? The, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act uh, also known as the FFCRA, which has to do with how you as a business owner need to operate and need to change your uh, paid sick leave policies, right? You get certain emergency FMLA, emergency paid sick leave. So there's certainly all those aspects involved. And you've got also, again, longstanding laws like the ADA, you know, the American Disabilities Act, which mm -hmm. is very relevant when an employer is screening new applicants for jobs hiring, firing, making accommodations. And now we're seeing more questions come up around COVID-19, around what to do if an employee uh, refuses to come to work and what to do if an employee requests a certain accommodation. You know, what if you're a small place that can't do it, that's going to do a hardship? How do you mm -hmm. respond? You know, what, what does the law say about testing? Can you test employees for COVID-19 diagnosis before coming on to your workspace? And the answer is yes. Can you test them for antibodies for COVID-19? The answer is no. It has to do with what the ADA allows in terms of the invasiveness of your medical information. Mm -hmm. And there are rules around the CDC guidelines around how to create a safe workplace. So there's really a lot out there. Unemployment insurance. Um, I mean, you know, we, if we had more time to talk, and I'd love to talk to you for hours because you're a missing guy. You know, well, that's that's why you're you're starting your own show, right? Because you can talk for, right. for weeks, days about this. Yep. <laughs> to get to go talk for days and days, exactly. Yeah. Um, but you know, one of my goals is to convey to people an overview of some of these laws and just some of the hot spots. You know, what are the most common needs of businesses? What are the most common concerns? What have I seen the most about that's happening? So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, please. You, of course. Sure. But also wanted to convey that. You know, if there's any good takeaway from, from this show today, that you don't know what you don't know. So I just caution this about being careful about you know, reading, say, a limited, uh, a limited excerpt or segment about employment law COVID-19, let's say, on, you know, on, Google, or on Google, like in, on the internet, like, you know, Googling an issue uh, and thinking that that's the whole, you know, right. whole shebang, right? <laughs> that's the issue in a nutshell, when in fact, it's much more complicated than that. So that's one of my goals is just give some information that's helpful and but also let people know well, what issues do I as a business owner, whether I'm uh, the, the coffee shop on the street or you know the tech service company where everyone works from home and I think yeah. to myself, this doesn't apply to me. My workers are all on home at home on Zoom and FaceTime and they're all online and so but actually you have, you have a lot of concerns thinking about. So so yeah, you know, I'd love to talk about that. I mean, I'm happy to follow your your lead. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's come up with my businesses. I've got a number of employees at each one, but they're all pretty small. Um, and it feels like, you know, these days you have to be super sensitive to everybody's needs. I mean, first and foremost, we had to really pay attention to our our customers and what was going to make them most comfortable so that they still had confidence to, uh, to you know, engage in commerce with us. But uh you know, if a if an employee says in any way to me these days, I, I don't, I'm not feeling so good. I'm like, you stay home. <laughs> like, just mm -hmm. we'll we'll cover it. Like, it's not even a problem. And and I'm not even, I, I you know, I'm less concerned about um, being penalized, you know, from any government agency for that. Uh, first and foremost, is just everybody's safety. Mm -hmm. But that's that for me, like top of mind. If you could talk for a moment about. Uh, about your your most recent discoveries dealing with uh, employees that 
uh, one are just say, you know, they're just like, I'm not feeling well, I don't want to come in or, or ones that, are, you know, are the opposite, you know, uh, appear to not feel so good, you know, not look so good. Mm -hmm. Um, but they, they're, they're interested in working. How can, how can employers navigate those two, uh, that they seem like the most sticky situations to me. They are sticky situations and they're very common. So I'm glad you brought them up. I'm also glad you're reminded to hear you say that, you know, you don't mind uh, tackling these issues, having people stay home, not just because of what the law might require or what the yeah. CDC guidelines might say, but because, you know, it's just right. It's good practice. It's, it's the promoting the safety of your employees and it's good karma. And, you know, I, if we backtrack a little bit, I don't know at what point, but I remember saying to you that there are a lot of these guidelines and regulations that I'm actually all for them. I think, you know, they'll, mm -hmm. the CDC guidelines, OSHA has, you know, to help create a safe workplace. The goal is we don't want workers coming back, getting sick and being a, a mass you know, cluster where then they go home and, you know, spread the disease, uh, COVID-19 to their families, loved ones, or, right. or random strangers. Um, so let's take each scenario. The person does not want to come in because it's been not feeling well. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would see that situation is interesting. I would also look at how long is the employee not wanting to come in for? Is it, hey boss, I don't want to come in today. I'm, I'm feeling like headache, a little achy, a little tired. Or, hey, I don't want to come in because right, I'm not feeling well. And it goes on for weeks and weeks. So there's no doctor, no medication, no medical follow-up. Mm -hmm. So if an employee doesn't want to come in, if they're not feeling well, especially these days, right, the good practice is to advise them to stay home. And if an employee is claiming that they're, you know, an ongoing issue of, let's say, like, you know, fever or chills or COVID-19 type symptoms, um, you can ask them for a doctor's note. You know, you're allowed under the ADA, under EEOC guidelines and recommendations to say, hey, you know, you've been out sick. We've got the pandemic, right? The symptoms uh, run the gamut. So you can request that they get tested. You can also take someone's temperature when they come back to work, mm -hmm. ask for symptoms. Um, so that's, I think, I would, I would say that if an employee does not want to come in, they're not feeling well, um, it's always beneficial to you to have them stay home. But when they do come back, right, you want to be careful because if you are not, say, taking certain precautions, another employee to get sick, is that a negligence cause of action? Is that an unsafe work yeah. environment? Now, there's another part of that, too, that, if I may, a little spinoff, an offset that I've seen, which is, um, employees that say, I'm not sick per se, I'm healthy, I'm fine, and no one in my family is sick, but you know, I read the news every day, man, it freaks me out, I don't want to come back, um, while there's COVID 19 is going on, you know, like I'm, you know, I'm afraid to like they, they, they take a subway, I'm afraid to take a bus, I don't want to walk to work, it's too hot, or they just don't want to come in. And they don't have a pre existing condition, and they're not in a high risk group, they're not, let's say, pregnant or over 60. So the question right is then how do you deal with that situation? And so they, they have to be very careful. You look at what are the reasons they're giving. That I, I say employers need to investigate, right? Communicate and, and document, and then negotiate with that employee. Um, so you know, right? Investigate, right? What's happening? Hey, what, when you say you're afraid to come in, some, some I've had clients of mine say, "Well, that's not a, a legal reason to stay home." I, I read the I read the Department of Labor guidelines. It says as long as they're healthy and not COVID nineteen. Uh, infected and they're not sick and they're not taking care of a child under 18, they have to come back. And if they don't, I'm going to fire them. And I always advise them, like, not so fast, because again, you're looking at, right, right one law, the, uh, the pandemic unemployment assistance and unemployment insurance, but you're not looking at, say, what's the reason they're giving for not coming? So if it's unfreed, is that fear part of an anxiety disorder they have? Are they someone that suffers from of generalized anxiety disorder or anxiety, severe anxiety. And in that case, you know, they might have disability under the ADA and under certain New York mm -hmm. City and state law. So maybe then you have to like ask, okay, well, do you need an accommodation? You know, do, do you need, for example, like say to come in and have your own private office? Do you need to work within say a staggered shift like from 10, 11, 8 PM to maybe seven so that you're missing rush hour, right? So you want to make sure you know the reason people want to stay home. Um, and also, you want to make sure that, you, again, so you want to inquire, well, what's going on here? How come you want to stay home? Sometimes I've had my clients say, I asked that question in the email, and the person wrote back and they said, um, they said, hey, oh, I don't, I don't want to come in because I make more money at home on unemployment. And that's not, of course, legal. That's an easy, okay, well, that's job abandonment. You can't do that. 
but the ones that say it's an unsafe work environment, or I don't feel safe at work, if they're making that complaint and you fire them, you could be construed as retaliating against them for a potential OSHA violation they might be stating. So I can talk more about that maybe in the next segment, but yeah. um, my point is you want to ask more questions and document responses and talk to an attorney like myself who can guide you through. I, one pressing question I have from what you said from the suggestion is documentation. What, like real quickly in like mm -hmm. 60 seconds, what would, what's the best way to document these conversations? Is it, is it an email thread? Is it, what, what would, how would you suggest an employer going about documenting this so that it's, there's, it's gotta be kind of time stamped in a way, correct? Correct. Yes. Good question. I definitely recommend email is a very, mm -hmm. first of all, people tend to speak more off the cuff in email and then not self censor Whereas if you're sending things through the mail, it could be as to respond and they talk to them. Uh, email is always good. Also, it keeps the continuity on the flow, as you mentioned. You've got a thread, timestamp. I don't recommend text, you know, because people sometimes they miss a text and they respond to text before that and they erase the text. Right. Um, I think email is great. If you send a certified letter, if an employee is really making serious allegations, that's something I can get mm -hmm. into in the next after the break. But email is a really good way to communicate, as well as phone and sometimes having a second person on the phone with you can be very helpful. I yeah. Think, I think. Cool. Great. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Sure. All right. We're going to take another quick break. Hang tight, everybody. We're going to come back and dig into this hole a little deeper. You're listening to the entrepreneurial web. Okay, folks, we're back again. It's Friday. You're listening to the entrepreneurial web. I'm your host, Jeremiah Fox. Today, I am joined by employment law and business law attorney, Eric Sarver. He's based here in New York city. And this guy's got a wealth of knowledge on the ever-changing regulatory situation with COVID-19 with your employees, but also your business. We were just discussing in the last segment, a couple scenarios. You've got uh, an employee that uh, is sick or claiming to be sick or is even just worried about getting sick. And like, what are some of the, you know, what are some of the appropriate responses and, and what, what are your rights as a, as a business owner, employee, employer, and what are their rights as an employee? And, and I had asked Eric in that last segment, we didn't get to it, but I'd, I'd love for you to pick up on that. And, and I think this could apply, <laughs> you probably would know, uh, an, an apparently not well employee or an apparently not well uh, customer. I mean, we've all seen the crazy sure. videos from like the Midwest where like guys won't wear a mask coming into a store mm -hmm. and it's fighting with employees. What, what are, are kind of, you know, we legally bound as business owners to say to, uh, and, and what kind of appropriate action is there for someone that is apparently sick? I just, I, I, you know, many times played out in my head once they, you know, reopen dining rooms, if I've got, you know, people sitting in my restaurant and somebody starts coughing and hacking up the lung and, you know, everybody's like immediately going to be uncomfortably looking around and it's, you know, it's going to fall on me to go up to that person. What can I say to them? Or if an employee, same thing. And I'm like, dude, you need to go home. And they're like, I need the money. I got to stay. Like how, what, what can we do in that situation? What's the best response? Sure. No, it's a great question. And it's one that I have seen as well. I've seen more of the folks that want to stay home, the people that want to come in because they have to work, mm -hmm. they've right. been home, they haven't made a lot of money. Well, first off, you have a right, a legal right, under any law, under the ADA, under the uh, Title VII, which covers this, like, age discrimination, or rather uh, race and, and so forth. And ADA covers age discrimination. But the point I'm making is you have a right as an employer under federal and state laws to send an employee home uh, if they appear sick, right? And if they're, you know, exhibiting symptoms. And so, especially if it's in good faith, and that's, I think, the key issue there. So, and again, talk about documenting. In the earlier segments, I mentioned employees that don't want to come in, document the reasons, right? If there's a disability involved, document the accommodation request. If there's a clean, unsafe work environment, document, show them how you keep the environment safe. You know, give them a floor plan, how you, but going to your issue now, um, you have, as a, as a business owner, right, you have, a, in fact, you have an obligation to create a safe working environment, right? So that's, you know, under OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, it's under uh, applicable state laws as well. So short answer, Jeremiah, is you can send an employee home if they're appearing sick, you know, and in fact, you're also allowed to take employees' temperatures. So if you're really unsure, right. you can write, say, hey, you know what, come over here, you look kind of feverish take the temperature 101 or 100.4 or more, you can say, okay, look, you have a fever, clearly you're not, you're not well, go home. And you could also request they come back with a doctor's note. 
Uh, the, the, the time people get into trouble is when an employer assumes that an employee is probably not well because of some distinguishing trait. Like, for example, you know, say you've got an employee who is 64 and still working in your company. And, you know, you see them clear their throat once or twice, you know, and you kind of automatically assume that, oh, well, they're older and, my God, they might be sick. And if, even if they're a little sick, they can die, so I'm going to send them right home. So you have to watch out that you're not using uh, sort of disparate, right, standards, like an unequal, excessively harsh standard. Or right. let's say you have an employee, right, who, you know, uh, may have a disability, maybe unrelated to COVID-19. You know, sometimes people see somebody in a wheelchair or a disability and they assume that, Oh, I've heard disabled are more susceptible. Well, some are, like with asthma or diabetes, but some are not. So my advice is you can certainly send somebody home. And in terms of customers also, right, same thing applies. Think of it as if you've got a customer who is exhibiting symptoms and you can say, hey, listen, you know, you seem to seem pretty sick. You know, I go for comfortable in a restaurant or with you in my place of business. Um, I'd ask you to, to leave. Same thing with people who are not following, you know, rules around masks or social distancing. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, the tricky situation, because if someone, if you ask someone to leave and that person is of Asian descent and they claim you're, you know, selecting them because of their Asian background, you might be facing discrimination suit. So one other thing I mentioned too is, right, if an employee is coming in, right, it's kind of mind boggling, right? A lot it of, is. <laughs> it must, it, sometimes I feel like my clients, like the way they talk, I feel as if they're experiencing walking through a, a minefield, you know, landmines, and yeah. you know, I stuff there. And again, you know, the law, right, it's meant to protect people, but, you know, you're doing the best you can, right, using common sense. So uh, I think, well, if you do send an employee home because they're sick, uh, or you think they're sick, you want to make sure you write out the situation. So, mm -hmm. you know, what about them that you think they were sick? Um, did other workers express concern to you? And if so, make sure you have that in writing as well. And again, just Make, 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 make it very clear that the reason they're being sent home uh, has nothing to do with their gender or their, their, you know, their race or their age or their nationality or you know, ability status. So I would say that, and I'd also say one more thing as well about this, which is um, say the employee that you're you know, sending home, uh, be mindful of what would you pay them in, the pay, in your next paycheck, right? Because the long-standing laws around this, under the federal and state law, FLSA and New York labor law, says that if you have a salary employee and they're home, uh, if a part of the week, you have to pay them for that week if they're, if they're not paid hourly. If they're an hourly worker and they're covered by certain rules on overtime and you pay them by the hour they're there, you, it's an interesting dilemma, right? You're allowed to say, look, you know, if you were sick, um, I thought you were sick, you want to come in, you're not working, I'm not gonna pay you for the time you weren't here. And then they don't really have a, a wage and hour claim, but again, if they claim that you're doing this to, you know, to retaliate against them or something they did or to try to cheat them out of their money, right. it could be pricey. You might wanna just pay them for the day. You know, if it's a, if it's yeah. a week, right, that's a lot of maybe you're losing a lot of money two weeks. If it's, if it's the, from they go home at noon and then it's four hours, I always advise, you know what? It's a very sticky time, right? You don't want to be a test case. You don't want to be yeah. that one that's in the news on every channel and station because, you know, like reporters are looking for COVID-19 stories. So, sure. So, you know, send them home and, and hey, if it, if it helps them to go home and say, listen, you know, go to a doctor, you know, go tomorrow. I'll pay you for today and tomorrow. Um, and you don't have to use your PTO time. It's like you're paying them to have a potential headache and a potential landmine or pitfall situation. So. Yeah. Yeah. Big time. No, that's great. That's really excellent advice, especially distinguishing between the salary and the hourly because I have both. Mm -hmm. And and that's, you know, that's, that's always a big concern. It's these people that rely on the hours. And that's who I was thinking of. It's that, you know, that scenario hadn't happened, but I, mm -hmm. I definitely like have a few guys that are just, they're just such hard workers and so dedicated and they, you know, mm -hmm. they're the breadwinners for their family. And it just every, every dollar counts, especially right now. Uh, you know, I could just see this arising and just how, how to navigate that. And that's a really great uh, suggestion is to, like you said, negotiate in some way. You said that earlier in the show, like find that negotiation point right. where it's not, it's not a battle where they feel uh, serviced in some way. And it's not, it's not a personal attack. I think if you show them, you know, that you have their best interest and, and the, you know, the business's best interest in mind, 
Um, and and, and you, you, you might have to pony up a little cash for that, which is not easy these days, but it, like you said, it might really save you uh, from, from digging out of a, a, a really uncomfortable <laughs> hole a little later on. Uh, what, what are some other um, kind of things that, it, that you've seen pop up that, that people have asked you about uh, unrelated to, to some of the questions that I've asked? Are, are there any other things off the top of your head that you just, you feel like employers need to know uh, this during this time? Yes, uh, that's an excellent uh, segue, I think, into other issues, which are similar. Um, and, and just to, if I can just reiterate your point, sometimes mm. a little bit of money now, it just, it shows good faith. I think, I think from the, the legal, also from the business component of things, right, the psychology of, of workers, people like to feel that like they're valued more than just the, the buck or the dollar. Mm. So, you know, if, if you do pay them for the day, there's that peace of mind that, okay, maybe this person already is concerned about my well-being and not just trying to sift me out of my shifts for my week. Yeah. Um, so that's a good point, I think, to put in there to make. Yeah. You know, other issues, Jeremiah, that I've seen that I also caution people about include, uh, let's see, well, you've got people who are, say, hiring, right? You've got employees that didn't come back. Maybe they, they moved or they got sick or they, they retired early. So when you're hiring, what questions can you and to ask, right? Um, yeah. And like COVID-19. And if you, let's say, give a candidate uh, a job offer and then you learn that they you know, might have COVID-19, you can delay their start date, right? You can delay it until they're you know, test negative or they're healthy and covered, mm -hmm. but you can't retract an offer simply based on the COVID-19 status because, yeah. right, you don't, it could be considered disability under the disability laws that's being litigated and tested in some uh, arenas right now. There are all kinds of opinions, yay or nay, and I we wouldn't even get into all that. You want to do that right now, but my point there is that, you know, you have to be right, very mindful of that, um, you know, that, that situation. So. I've seen certainly that, that you know, matter come up, um, right, it's number one. Uh, another issue involves, say, business owners who have employees who are now working from home. And, right, let's say they have hourly employees or overtime. It becomes difficult to track employees out in the same way as when they came into the office, mm -hmm. right, into the workplace. So, you know, maybe you have, like, say, like, you know, a uh, restaurant worker who um, maybe does certain type of functions that they do from home that are obviously not a server or a waiter or a bus boy or right. a bus person. But um, so you want to make sure that, you know, you're tracking the hours properly and that, you know, be mindful if, if you run a professional service, if you're, say, a, a tech company or advertising company, uh, be mindful of sending employees their emails, texts, or phone calls after hours that when you're asking for a response, because what happens then is, right, you're extending their hours, essentially. Maybe they're working more than 40 hours a week. And so they're now entitled to overtime. This is an issue we found coming up more and more before COVID-19 with mm -hmm. the onset of commuting, of uh, the onset of right, you know, tele telecommute and telework. Um, no, I think that's certainly an issue that comes up. And I think maybe lastly, let's see, I covered um, right, the employees, oh, that is hiring employees with their disability or if they have COVID-19. Um, I'd also say just being mindful of being able to document and demonstrate that you have a safe workplace. And yeah. also having employee handbooks and updates. I really can't trust this enough because, you know, when an employee is surprised by something, they tend to get defensive and react. Yeah. If you've got all, everything I've discussed laid out in an updated, revised employee handbook, and I really, really have been telling all my clients, you know, you need to update your handbooks, your employee manuals. It gives people the lay of the land. They know in advance, like for example, if you're sick, you know, you will be sent home or subject to a COVID-19 test or a temperature check. They know that going into the phase of the situation. Um, if you know that you have to have certain CDC guidelines in place and some of the challenges that you didn't, and you can get a copy of your, you know, the blueprints of your compliance, stick it in the handbook, have people sign off on it. So I have had some, some of my clients say, you updated my handbook in February this year, which I did because I like to update yearly, but then COVID-19 hit. So um, I, I also, yeah, just having safe, rather sound policies around safety, having security, uh, having clarity for your employees is really key advice that I give. Yeah, and that's great. And it's, it's documentation. It's just further documentation. Exactly. Like, yeah. that, that, you, that they saw it. You have their signature dated that they saw the handbook. These are the policies. So that when something arises, it's not such a surprise. Or even if they get defensive, at least you have that documentation that, this employee was aware of this, 
it, you know, this, right. that this was going to be protocol, that this would be the situation and this is the situation and then document the situation as well as, as a double backup. I'm all about reinforced wedges everywhere. So absolutely. I, 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 jujitsu I, concept. Okay. <laughs> so I said, it's a jujitsu concept. And oh. I, I try to bring it into, uh, into the workplace in a non-physical fashion, <laughs> right, right, yeah. metaphorically, of course. Right. All right, we're going to take one more quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about uh, some of the other things you have to offer and what your future with talking alternative broadcasting might look like. So hang tight, everybody. One more segment coming up. We'll be back in just a minute. Okay, everybody, we're back. Last section of the show here again. We're talking with employment law and business law attorney Eric Sarver. He's based out of New York City. He's got a ton of great advice. He shared so much awesome stuff with us already in the show. And Eric himself, uh, I believe, is going to be starting his own show here on the network uh, next month, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, you know, he could literally go on and on and on at length about this very valuable information. And it looks like he's going to get that chance. Uh, is that correct, Eric? Am I am I? Absolutely. Um, you're correct. Uh, I will have my own show. I would just say something maybe tongue in cheek. I'll go on and on, but not on and on and on. That's uh, my my pledge to. Um, okay, I, 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 I might have been channeling through you because I could I could go. On. I'm just totally kidding there. I'm just joking there. Yeah. But yeah. um, you know, so thank you for uh, mentioning that. Yeah. So I'll be hosting a show just like folks see Jeremiah is doing here, and I hope to do as good a job as you are because you like your questions and you follow up. I got to say, thank I've done you on the shows, and your follow up is it's like reflective and mirrors back you know what's being said. So. So my show, um, so working with the title, so far I like the thought, I thought about employment law matters, right? Because there are matters of employment law and it matters. So maybe, yeah, you get the, the pun there. Uh, and it, it'll be about basically advice, guidance, and resources for the business owner, right? For the small business, the mid-sized company. Uh, it'll be a, for an audience of, if you're out there in retail, if you're in hospitality, or if you're in accounting, or if you're in digital marketing or media, if you're an accountant, if you're an architect, basically special service providers, uh, as well as manufacturers, anyone who owns a business. And I, I, I'd like to have maybe three components of the show, right? Number one is to be information, right? People need information in these times. Mm. So to talk about some of the new laws, maybe the new guidelines right, that we discussed today, um, let people know what the law requires, but also to let them know like what issues to be aware of. Because again, if you're looking at something and you think it's a one, a one issue or a one topic issue, you're going to take an action that might not consider other ramifications. So it would be about information. And um, the second part will be about resources and support. So I'll be having guests on my show, guests who, some of whom are in the employment law realm. They might be HR consultants and experts. They might be uh, you know, HR guidance, employee relations folks, people who, uh, who help foster an environment that they have diversity inclusion, for example, and also CPAs or CFOs to help businesses get some information about what you need, especially now in the pandemic, when everyone's tight on money, right? Resources are scarce, the economy's tight, you have all these you have all these restrictions. So how do you manage your cash flow? How do you maximize it? I might have, for example, uh, colleagues who are in that in that area, financial advisors come up. Um, and lastly, I want to talk about, you know, I want to get a little philosophical because I love philosophy I think in college. So I love like, you know, just like riffing on, you know, all the different concepts. And so we'll talk about, right, what are some of the healthy mindsets that I've seen that a business owner mm -hmm. needs to survive and thrive? Maybe you can relate to this, Jeremiah, with your you know, current businesses and such during these times. And it's been my experience that the clients that operate, you know, from a very fear-based or scarcity thinking or angry mentality, the ones that are taking things very personally and assault, um, they tend to shoot from the hip. They tend to be more, much more reactive, not thoughtful or proactive in, in situations. And they tend to take drastic measures. They call me up, you know, I fired these four employees because they did this. And, you know, did you ask them about their ADA accommodation that we talked about? Well, no, I was so mad that I just fired them. So, you know, trying to get people to see that the, the more patient, the more uh, sort of right, step back and ask for help mentality tends to help you, the business owner, to thrive. And it goes back to that quote that I mentioned earlier, which I wish I can find the source, but there are two types of people in the world. There are people who need help and ask for it and get it, 
people who need help and don't ask for it, essentially, and don't, right? They don't get help. So at the point, of course, everyone needs help. So I, yes. I just have found that we, we talk about, right, what are some business owners' fears? People might want to call in. You know, what are your, what are your main concerns in this time? Because that impacts is how you react to the situation. So if for informational tips and resources, uh, guidance from other professionals, I'll have guest speakers, maybe business owners who can talk about what they're experiencing. And then, of course, just a little bit of, right, philosophy, a little, you know, some, yeah. some armchair psychology. I'm, I'm not a psychologist, but, you know, maybe I can give some. No, uh, but it's funny as, as business owners, and I mean, you not only owning your own business for so long, but also assisting business owners for all this time, you have to have just rolodexed a ton of <laughs> experiences and, and what, what are the good responses? What are the good or the bad ones, you know, and, and seeing the outcomes of those. And, you know, it's, it's great that you say that, especially that the last piece of, you know, the third component of your show, because I think that really, uh, that was one of the attractive features for, for me to, uh, to talking alternative broadcasting is that that's kind of inherent in it all. And it's a big part of what business owners need today. I mean, you, you kind of know, like <laughs> when your bank account is tanking or whatever, you know, you, those are, those are kind of physical things. And, 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 and you, uh, you know, it does, it does incite certain emotions and, and it can make you insane. And what I think people needed the most during this time was the, the psychological assistance less so than like, where do I spend this money? Where do I spend that money? You kind of mm. saw the wheels falling off the bus and you, you know, if mm. you're experienced, you know what to do. I saw a lot of people panic. And, yeah. and, and I, I don't know if it comes with a lack of experience because I saw uh, people that, it, that have been in business for a long time panic, but, but it certainly is a common trait of somebody that's newer to the game. And that can put you in like, like you said, it's never just a one topic situation, is it, right? You think it's just one thing and it almost never is. It's always coming from multiple angles. And if, mm -hmm. uh, and if you're in that, that, you know, that kind of blinders uh, kind of line of sight, you, you're not going to see some of those other, those other things coming at you. Uh, and, you know, to rope jujitsu back into, I try to mention jujitsu in every show I've trained for five years. That was, that was the thing that helped me the most was martial arts values of being patient and not, uh, not overreacting and not letting your emotions creep into things. It's always like a reduction mm -hmm. of ego. And that's a big component in being a business owner. Like you said earlier, you, you think you're going to, you know, not have to answer anybody. And it turns out once you get up to the top, you just fold down and you answer to everybody <laughs> instead of, you know, where maybe you just had a few bosses before. <laughs> now it's, it's all your employees. It's all your customers. It's every government agency. It's all your vendors. It's, it's right. everybody. And it, you just have to really let your ego go to not make, uh, you know, bad decisions. Uh, we do have just a couple minutes left. Um, before we wrap up, have you chosen a time, a day and time slot yet for your show? Yes, we'll be going on Tuesdays from 5 to 6 p.m. in September. I'm still working out with uh, Sam, Shelly Wicks from the station, um, whether it'll be the first Tuesday after Labor Day or the one following that. Okay. But we'll be going on Tuesdays, every Tuesday between 5, and, 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And of course, we'll have the links and I'll be letting people know via LinkedIn and, and Facebook and email and such. And, uh, Talking about things you mentioned, including the reduction of ego. It's so funny you say that, Jeremiah, because I am not into karate. I did take it, I think, when I was about 15, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't step into the ring and, you know, hear, you know, <laughs> many decades later and wouldn't call myself an expert by, by any means. But uh, in terms of, right, patience, calm, learning to step back, learning to pause, learning, learning to let go of ego, uh, I do practice Buddhism and meditation. Mm -hmm. And so I found that, you know, like say meditation, like it's been great for me, including with my clients. You know, I love my clients. I have a lot of great clients. Um, I may have one or two clients that might occasionally grate on my nerves. If you're my client watching, it's not you, I promise. Not but, you, not the one watching. But I'm from two years ago, that's it. Yeah, two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, knowing what to say, knowing when to say it, and knowing also when your ego is stepping into the situation. I've seen yeah. clients that have blown up great, a resolution of a case or you know a litigation over a dispute over a hundred dollars because they just thought the other side you know was entitled to a hundred dollars more and they spent much much more than that on my services and to keep fighting <laughs> and when I pointed it out it was well it's a principle of things so and maybe yeah. that's the case but maybe it's their ego is getting in and so um love what you said about that and definitely want to incorporate that into my show as well 
they don't have a, a mindfulness meditation instructor. You know, one of my colleagues, you know, uh, is a great attorney, also practices yoga, and has talked about how she uses meditation and yoga. And when she is before the court in the heated dispute, the judge is yelling at her, other sides of arguing, she can stay focused, read through a transcript, and counter, make counterpoints. And so, yeah. It's a, it's a great practice and folding that into the show. I think, like I said, I try to mention jujitsu in, in every show because it's, it just applies everywhere. It's, it's, it's in the, in the universe around us. So, well, I really look forward to, uh, to your show. Please share the links with me. Cause you know, I'm always shooting stuff out on social media. I'd be glad to help you, uh, to get that out. And, uh, yeah, everybody listening, please check out Eric's show. Uh, if you're a business owner, it's just going to be a constant wealth of knowledge for you in terms of, uh, you know, regulation, it sounds like some mindfulness and uh, just best business practices. So thank you. Really appreciate, appreciate you coming on and sharing uh, your, you know, that valuable information. It certainly was insightful to me. Hopefully the rest of you got some value out of it. You all have a great weekend, everybody. Take care. We'll see you next week. You're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. Peace out.